Yeah. So, please find a comfortable seat. So, welcome everybody. Um, it's great to see so many people here and already networking. There will be more opportunities for that later in the day. I'm Harriet Bradley and I'm the head of the Cap and Food Programme at the Institute for European Environmental Policy, organising this conference today. And I'll be guiding us through the day um, and the agenda, which is split into two parts. So we've got a first part uh, taking a look at the bigger picture, what we need to achieve in the coming decade and why it's such an important decade. And then the second part will be introducing the vision that IEP has developed with a number of other think tanks for how to reform uh, the policy framework in, uh, for the next cap. And this will be followed by a lunch, and we really encourage everybody to stay for lunch and uh, take benefit of the delicious catering that has been provided. So, yeah, a uh, couple of quick um, practical points. Uh, the Wi-Fi is uh, available and written on the wall at the side here. Um, and also, we will be recording the event. So um, the recording will be available on our website afterwards as well. Without further ado, I give the floor to Ira, who is IEP's Executive Director. Thank you, Harriet. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you today to this IAP event on the future of the common agricultural policy. As you know, IAP has focused on sustainability since the very beginning of its activities some 47 years ago. This also applies to EU agri agricultural policies, which have retained a central role in our work. The purpose of our event today is to discuss the future of European land use and farming and to provide some inputs to the revision of the EU budget and the CAP before decisions are taken on its future structure. The contents of today's presentation are a result of a collaborative effort that was made with the members of the Think Sustainable Europe network that IEP has been coordinating since it was established in 2019. I want to thank all our partners that were involved in the preparation of the CAP vision reports, as well as the European Climate Foundation, and of course the European Commission through its life program for the financial support that we received to this work. The reason for preparing this publication is obvious. As you are all aware, we are not on track in delivering the pledges made at the Paris Climate Summit in 2015 we are already very close to exceeding 1.5 degrees in global warming, which is widely considered as a safe limit to avoid a chain reaction that could endanger the future of humanity. During the next decade, every sector in society will have to step up its efforts to mitigate climate change and protect ecosystems. In the land use sectors, these challenges are deeply interconnected. We need a more multidimensional approach than the current CAP, promoting sustainable land use as a whole across the EU, from agriculture to forestry and to wetlands. But this sustainability transformation cannot happen in isolation from other needs, including the need to ensure sufficient production and rural livelihoods. I understand this coming from Finland, where forestry has a key role in our economy. We need to engage in a constructive dialogue about how to deliver on multiple dimensions and how best to support farmers and land managers in the transition that is needed. A critical piece of the puzzle is the question of funds and hence the future of the CAP. Today, we will hear high-level experts who will give their inputs on this topic. I look forward 
to a lively de debate on, and your reactions to our proposals. I wish you an interesting seminar and look forward to your reactions. Thank you. We now welcome Arta Rungometska to give some opening remarks. Uh, Arta is a fellow at the Mercator Research Institute for Global Commons and Climate Change. Until 2021, he was a director at the DG for Climate Action at the European Commission. And he's also had the role as a lead negotiator for the EU and the Paris Agreement. He's also got a PhD in agricultural economics. Thanks, Arta. <laughs> Thank you, Harriet, <coughs> for the very kind introduction. And I think the most important thing is I'm an agriculture economist. <laughs> and sp speaking like that today, um, only a few meters away where I was working uh, for almost 20 years. So what do I want to do? And I already see that I've changed uh, the title of my speech a little bit. Um, why will the next decade be critical in the transition to sustainable and resilient European agriculture and land use? And I want to touch on a few points. Um, on the next slide, there's an outline. Um, and just to warn you already that I'm not going to be Wikipedia here to tell you everything about land use and agriculture and all the problems that are around. But I'm going to be selective because I want to stay in time. The discussion afterwards is going to be much more important. So I want to talk about the challenges that are ahead of us or where we live in right now in the middle of it. And then I will conclude with how we can turn that into opportunities. And that will bring me then to the policy points. The first point, and I think um, you already mentioned that, um, we are reaching the 1.5 degrees. And I think that is something where farmers are really getting worried. Um, it's almost every week in the news that a little disaster is happening somewhere in Europe, which is weather related, and that is affecting farmers. And farmers have not yet grappled on how to deal with that. It's droughts, it's floods, it's uh, decreasing soil fertility, it's forest fires for the foresters, um, and nobody really knows what to do and how to react. And I think we really need a policy in the coming years, and I mean starting now, not waiting for the tw uh, 2030s, where we look at this in order to make sure that the basis for food security, our environmental security, is really um, secure in the coming years. The next topic um, that is important is that we will see increased competition for land already today. Uh, we have a fierce discussion in the European Parliament on the nature restoration law where we say even setting aside 30% of the land for biodiversity is going to be difficult. But what we also will see, and I'm more worried about that even, is the increased competition for biomass. Kind of where do we get all the biomass people are expecting to help them in the industrial sector, in the energy sector? Um, and I think what we will have to do is to start setting priorities. You see here on the right hand side how biomass is being used today. A lot still goes into the energy sector. And I think many economists tell us that's the worst thing you can do with biomass. It's the lowest value in the whole thing. Still, our policies in Europe are favoring the burning of biomass or using it for biofuels. So there is a lot of change that is required. On the other hand, we have a lot of carbon that still goes into industry that is fossil fuel based. If we want to keep that, these industries in Europe, we need to find another source of carbon. And I think all the calculations that I have seen tell me that is really high value for the product of biomass. So that's probably something we will have to look at. And finally, recycling. You see how little recycling is being done on biomass to put it really into a carbon cycle. So also here, I think there is a task for public policy in order to get that right. But let's come to the next point. The next point is that we see geopolitics have become very volatile, and it is affecting 
EU sovereignty. And I think farmers in particular, last year, if you remember, how we, they were affected by rapidly rising fertilizer prices, how they were affected by rapidly rising commodity prices um, in terms of soy, for instance, which is feeding part of the farming community in, in, uh, in Europe uh, in terms of their business. And I think this is something that is probably not going to go away very quickly uh, in the coming decades. So that also means in terms of sovereignty, we will have to look at how to um, diversify our trade relations internationally in order to make sure that we will have what we require, but we will also have to look at maybe we need to adjust our production systems in order to rely to a lesser extent on imports in the future. And of course, there's also some international questions related to the whole trade issue. And finally, I think that we should never forget on the next slide, you will see that the population in the world is still increasing. So there is going to be increasing demand for food also in the coming decade. Of course, the population is not rising as fast as what we have seen over the last 30, 40, 50 years. Still, the, um, uh, the way, I mean, in terms of the demand, the structure of the demand is going to change because people become richer and it's very likely that there will be more demand for livestock products, and that is going to cause a huge problem. Now let's come to the nature base in the next slide. Um, I don't know, the social side is that the rural livelihoods are going to be challenged as well. I think what we have experienced is the structural change over many decades already, many people leaving the land not farming any longer. And that, I think, is a trend that is going to continue and that has dramatic impacts on rural areas. Um, what it also says is that um, probably the common agriculture policy that has one of its objectives to keep farmers on the land maybe was not as effective as what we had hoped for. So I think this is something that will be looked at, will have to be looked at when we look at the common agriculture policy in the future. There's not only challenges here, because what we also know it is that if you rejuvenate the farming policy, the farming community, then you will have probably young farmers, young people who are maybe a bit more open to continue to change and to pick up all the challenges that are ahead of them. The next point, the third area, is Europe's natural resource base that is eroding. And I've talked about that already on my first slide. Soils, the weather, rain, everything is being affected. And here, farming, as we know, and forestry also plays a role because they're also contributing to the problem. And I mean here greenhouse gas emissions, but I also mean loss of biodiversity. And if we look forward, the policy that is being um, proclaimed and bought into in Europe is climate neutrality by the year 2050, when residual emissions are going to be balanced by removals of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And we know that what the energy sector will have to do, the industrial sector will have to do, what transport will have to do, energy should fully decarbonize before the year 2035 in the EU if we want to be there in the year 2050. But now I'll have a look at where agriculture needs to be or kind of what the models and the projections showed. Agriculture should be climate neutral in the year 2035. So it's the sector after the energy sector where we have opportunities to reduce emissions and where we have opportunities to remove more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And again, it's another demand on the agriculture sector, something farmers are not paid for at the present point in time, or foresters, to keep carbon stocks. And that, I think, is one of the reasons you see them vanishing. So I think there's also here a big question mark on whether it is going to be possible to achieve these dotted green lines that you can see on the left-hand side in terms of 
removing so much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And climate change itself is threatening that as well. So the, I think there is a major task here in order to get agriculture on a new trajectory. Unfortunately, what we have seen since the year 2000 in Europe is that agriculture emissions are stagnant. They are not going down. And I think one of the reasons is that price signals are just not there. Secondly, I think we have to look at, and that's on the next slide, um, is biodiversity, uh, which is also part um, of the reasons that we can make agriculture work. The pollinators is always the example that is being taken, but there is many other issues that contribute to having a viable farming in the rural areas. So the pronounced uh, goals and targets of the European Union to try to protect 30% of land in Europe and also 30% of the sea is still out there. And it is agriculture and forestry that will have to contribute to that. I know about the big fight that is going on in the European Parliament, which shows that um, farmers are not happy in the way these policies are being set. And I think it is encouraging for uh, President von der Leyen to say, I think we need to kind of go one step backwards and start talking also to the farming community in an earnest, in an honest way. Um, I think that is the only way to get us forward on the many things that need to be done on the side of restoring and protecting biological diversity. So let's come to my last, now to my um, other issue that is very much linked to it, uh, and that has also been mentioned this morning, is food. Because food and how people eat and what they eat and what the kind of the quantities that, uh, there are and the type of food they eat is going to shape the demand for the food and the farming sector. And I think what we see is some very poor trends. And I'm only picking out here one, which is overweight and obesity. And the curve here you see is not one for the entire population. It is for kids. And I think that is something when you go these days through the streets of Brussels or Berlin or London or wherever, uh, or Paris, um, I think you see a lot of overweight children. And I think to kind of blame them for this problem, I think that would be the wrong thing to do. Um, but we need to solve this problem because all the um, trends into the future are only upwards. And it's not linear. It is increasing and increasing. And this is going to create a problem in terms of diabetes, for instance, in the next 10, in the next 20 years, something I'm told the public health system will not be able to economically carry. And it's one of the issues where politicians still put their hand into the sand. Because nobody wants to be seen on the first page of the news that this guy is stealing the steak from my plate. But this will have to be addressed if we want to get agriculture land use right. So let me conclude in five short sentences. Number one, I think, and that needs to start now, is that we need to support farmers, foresters, and the rural areas to adapt to climate change and to make their business resilient. That's not a task that can wait until we introduce the next common agriculture policy reform. What we also need to do is to design tangible incentives and long-term investment support. And that's also not only the future, it's also the current cap. There is opportunities in the cap strat uh, strategies. Some of those have been mentioned, but I must say I'm pretty disappointed how little new ideas have come to the table over the last three, four years, while the problems are going to uh, become so deep. We need to think of how to support small farms and to create opportunities for rural areas. We need to make sure that we have the right level of support for biodiversity and ecosystems, so to help farmers to really be proactive and not come with feeble money that is not going to be sufficient. Um, and also on innovation, uh, which is going to be important if we want to solve the problems 
because some of the solutions are not yet there. And thirdly, and I'm here kind of very convinced that if we can't get prices right, then very little is going to happen. At the moment, it really doesn't pay for a farmer to use technologies that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, he will always be at a disadvantage in the market. So introducing a kind of carbon price is something that I believe we will have to do, as we have done in the energy sector, as we have done for shipping, aviation, industry, transport, and also buildings lately. We need to think of that and how to do that. That, of course, is not going to be done overnight. That will take a few years, but we need to start thinking about that now. And the same is true for water. Agriculture and farming and forestry is the main user of water, and that is with, with a, a commodity that is going to get very scarce. I think if you talk to colleagues in Spain or Portugal or Italy, or even um, in the Balkans or Romania, Bulgaria, um, you will hear a lot of uh, complaints on water getting really short. And again, I think without pricing water properly, we are not going to get to the right uh, conclusion. And there's many, um, I think, approaches that can be used there. And then fourthly, I've said so loudly already, politicians will have to start to address the public health issues, and that goes beyond overweight and obesity. It has a huge repercussion for land use and agriculture, and it's going to give us a lot of headroom if we get it right. Uh, we calculated that if everybody would just do what the WHO says is a healthy diet, kind of we would be so much less under pressure when it comes to implementing climate policies. My final point, um, and that I think is one of the most important ones, I just made it before, is we need to mobilize farmers in earnest and foresters. If we start to kind of come from top down and instruct them what to do, that's not the right way of doing it. Command and control, I think um, the past has shown, it doesn't work. So we need to get farmers and foresters on our side and we need to forge alliances with them across the board. So that means all people here in the room, in the end, should move into the same direction and not in so many different directions what they are doing at the present point in time. So I'm looking forward to have a discussion uh, on these issues. Thank you very much. <laughs> well on time. Amazing. Do you want to sit down? Yeah. Thank you so much, Arthur. I think that outlined the range of interconnected challenges um, that we face and the urgency of also tackling them. So to discuss this, uh, we've now got a panel which will be moderated by Alice Hancock, who is a journalist at the Financial Times here in Brussels, and uh, she reports on energy, climate, environment, and agriculture. So. Welcome, Alice. <laughs> um, and uh, to join the discussion, we have Melanie Klomper. Um, Melanie is a regenerative farmer in the Netherlands, and she is the founder of the Soil Heroes Foundation. So, Melanie, please come and take a seat. Um, we also have Alan Matthews. Uh, many of you may, may know him. He's a professor emeritus of EU agricultural policy at Trinity College Dublin in Ireland. So, Alan. <laughs> and we also have Faustine Badefosse. Um, she's the director at the European Environmental Bureau for Nature, Health and Environment, which includes the agriculture and food portfolio. Thanks. Thanks so much, Harriet, and um, thank you all for being here. I'm delighted to be, well, A, here to hear everything that um, Arthur has laid out, Ira has laid out. This is a very timely report, um, and I mean, I think as Arthur well put it, there's a scale of this problem, a breadth and a depth that really needs addressing and addressing quickly. Um, I'm going to ask everyone to give some reactions to what Arthur said, just to sort of set the scene, and then we are going to have sort of two 
two halves of discussion, if you like. Um, one will sort of be looking at, the, the main aim is to look at how we can unlock change, how we can really um, think about uh, the next CAP cycle. Um, and we want to address, you know, where the next commission should take the Green Deal, the farm to fork agenda, and then look at the um, perspectives on the CAP and how important that is, what role should it play, riffing off the IEEP report, of course. Um, so, Faustine, I don't know if you want to start off with some initial reactions to Arthur's uh, sure. remarks there. Thanks. Sure. I felt I was going to be last, but I'm happy to be first, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Uh, yes, so Archer gave us a very worrying picture, if I may, about uh, the state of play and the challenges that the sector and all of us are faced with. Um, last week, the Stockholm Resilience Center uh, published its update on the planetary boundaries. For the first time ever, uh, all nine planetary boundaries were mapped out. Six have been crossed. Six. I don't know about you, but uh, as a parent, as a mother, uh, I find it extremely and increasingly difficult to keep a smiling face when my daughter tells me what she wants to do when she will be a grown-up, because I don't know what her future will be. It is extremely, extremely concerning. But behind this uh, picture of serious ill planets, it is our own survival uh, that is at stake. And let's be clear, our unsustainable food system and ultimately our agricultural production model is playing a great share in this sobering picture. Now, it is extremely scary, but I think it's important to bear in mind that somehow, in that uh, sobering picture, the good news is that as much as we are the problem, we can also be the solution to that. Because uh, the you know, specificity with what we call the Anthropocene is that we are the drivers of this extension. So let's change that. <coughs> but time is of essence. And the more we wait, the more difficult it will be. And that's what we see, you know, I was saying to uh, uh, colleagues uh, in the corridor that, you know, I've been, I've been speaking about the CAP for now a long time, and I would like to compare, you know, all the speeches and the sense of urgency is just increasing and increasing. But, you know, there will be uh, a tipping point, and uh, we should certainly not get there. So it is certainly not the time to slow down, even though we see that there is a push for that, but it is a time to double down on the Green Deal delivery, and we will talk about that in a second. What I would like to highlight as a reaction to what you said is that obviously, and it was clear also from your presentation, there is a need to tackle consumption and production together. Uh, we have focused for too long on production alone, and consumption is a great uh, a part of the problem and is a driver of unsustainable protection, production. Sorry, The elephant in the room, such as animal protein overconsumption, and production needs to be tackled once and foremost. We need to cut food waste, shorten supply chain, waste less energy, water in the process, stop polluting our soil, move to agroecology. What we need is a profound transformative change. That's what we have to do. We need to reverse the trends, climate change, pollution, biodiversity loss, but at the same time, because it's already happening, as you say, and farmers are the first in line, we also need to adapt to that. But we should certainly not maladapt to it. We should find the right way to adapt, and some of the solutions are in nature. And I would like to finish here with uh, saying that uh, instrumentalizing the social consequences of system change, as we see, to prevent any sort of change, is everything but socially fair. Thank you so much, Faustine. Uh, that really... Um yeah, it is incredibly sobering, actually, when you see these reports, you're entirely right. Um, Alan, any reflections from you? Yeah, well, I think Arthur gave us a, a, a really tremendous overview of uh, the many challenges, and uh, you can sort of classify them in, in, in various ways. We can talk about the triple challenge, uh, often used in a global context of providing enough food for the growing population, uh, but doing so sustainably, and at the same time, uh, providing livelihoods for those engaged in the sector. We can talk about the different dimensions of uh, sustainability, the economic, social, uh, and environmental uh, dimensions. And I guess uh, the issue is that sometimes we can identify synergies uh, between these different um, uh, elements, but often there are trade-offs. Um, and it's managing those trade-offs and, and uh, identifying the priorities, uh, which is uh, the key issue in political uh, debate. 
And uh, we saw uh, uh, four years ago, um, with the uh, announcement of the European Green Deal, uh, a response, first of all, of course, to uh, the publication of uh, uh, very convincing scientific reports of the state of the globe, the IPCC uh, uh, reports, the uh, uh, Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. We have our own uh, European Environment Agency, State of the Environment reports, um, all highlighting what Faustine and, and Arthur have identified as, as the challenges. And of course, that was then reflected in a political movement, which resulted in changes in the composition of the European Parliament, uh, and ultimately in the uh, political platform of uh, the incoming uh, Commission president. That is now uh, po potentially changing. We, we now face a, a, another European election in, uh, in, in uh, less than a year's time. Um, and the debate is changing. As Arthur pointed out, there is th th this movement to slow down uh, 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 this change. Um, and the argument is, is often made in terms of uh, uh, um, uh, contrasting, uh, if you like, the uh, environmental uh, challenges and the need to address those with, uh, with food security. Um, and I think this is a completely misplaced uh, uh, contradiction. It's clear that uh, certainly in the long run, um, uh, you cannot have a viable and sustainable agriculture without uh, a healthy uh, environment. Uh, and I think farmers themselves would, uh, would accept that. Um, we, all, we, we see, interestingly enough, uh, some, some contradiction. It's really a question of uh, 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 sort of how we use our land. Uh, there is this sense uh, that in order to address food security, we need to maximize production. We cannot allow production to fall. Whereas, uh, of course, what we really need to focus on is uh, ensuring sustainable production, ensuring that production remains within uh, our uh, uh, biophysical uh, boundaries. And I think a, a good example to look at uh, is in the case of um, uh, fishing and, and, and fish stocks, where it's clear that taking the scientific advice and, and imposing quotas on how much fish could be, uh, could be caught, and in some cases even closing off uh, fishing grounds for a period, allowed stocks to recover. Um, and you know, we do, do have a healthier situation in terms of uh, uh, fish in, 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 in various um, uh, ocean areas. But there was this short-term trade-off. Um, um, uh, in terms of not food security, uh, but in terms of livelihoods. And I think that's the issue that we need perhaps to, to think about. Uh, so we need to drive the, the, uh, the, um, uh, the green transition forward, but we also need to reflect on how to, in a sense, uh, manage the, uh, the livelihood, the, 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 the adverse, potentially adverse effects in the short term. Uh, on farmer livelihoods. And I just want to put four points that uh, occurred to me. The first is, of course, the importance of setting targets. Uh, so uh, we, we see this in the climate area where we've done this successfully. Now, you can argue that the targets are not ambitious enough, but uh, we, we do have targets, um, and we need to continue to, uh, to, uh, to introduce these targets, including for nature restoration, including for pesticide use and so on. Secondly, we need to look at, the, uh, at how we achieve those targets. And uh, we have a range of instruments. We have regulation. We have uh, market incentives, which can be subsidies, where the TAP is, of course, the most important player. Um, and we also have innovation, and we have uh, education, knowledge exchange, uh, and, and, and uh, advisory services. So using that portfolio of interventions, and of course, the CAP is what we're going to discuss. We'll come back to it in a moment. Uh, but clearly, we do need to think about how we can make better use of uh, the very considerable resources in the CAP uh, uh, to target particularly uh, the behavioral change that Faustine has, has talked about, rather than, in a sense, uh, 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 distributing the money in an untargeted way. Thirdly, and I totally agree with Faustine, that we it's, it's not just a question of, of, of production. It's also a question of seeing uh, and changing uh, uh, the, the demand for food. Because farmers, in a sense, are at the end, uh, produce for a market. And we cannot just simply ask them to change what they're producing and how they're doing so if they're not supported through the, uh, through the food system. Um, the uh, Commission's approach is, and I think it's worth pursuing, uh, is to introduce sustainability labeling. We have to see whether that framework law uh, emerges later this year. Uh, but in my view, it's not going to be sufficient. We do need somehow to see 
uh, these social costs and, and, and uh, also the social benefits of uh, particular types of farming uh, reflected better in the prices uh, that consumers pay. And that's difficult because we can see already in terms of uh, the um, uh, cost of living crisis and food price inflation, we see consumers already moving away. In France, for example, uh, demand for organic produce has uh, fallen uh, very considerably and, and uh, many farmers are are, 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 are f f facing difficulties because of that. But we do need to see this as a, as a joined up system in terms of consumption and production. And then my final point is also there is an external dimension. Um, now to the extent that we are um, uh, addressing uh, negative externalities which actually uh, negatively affect us, whether it's water pollution, whether it's uh, uh, air quality, um, uh, th there isn't really a case for saying that you know, we need to uh, 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 protect ourselves against uh, uh, competition. This is simply something we need to do uh, uh, in our own interests. But there are cases certainly where uh, we should be thinking about also uh, uh, looking at the external dimension of what we are asking our own farmers to do, and particularly in the environmental area where this can also, uh, should be applied to, uh, to import. So those are my four points, Alice, yeah. Excellent, four points. Lots that we can uh, latch onto when we come to discussing in just a moment. Um, Melanie, do you want to have a, uh, your thoughts? Yes. Um, yes, so there is uh, a lot of what you ask for from farmers, and, and from my perspective, being a farmer myself in the Netherlands, uh, I see it as a, a holistic system. So it's a holistic system for the food chain. So it's not one solution, it's a whole system which needs a transition. It's the same that farmers need to farm in a holistic way also. So they don't need to think only about uh, creating uh, food and, and the, uh, for the highest yield, but they also need to create biodiversity. They also need to create and increase soil health because um, those are the providers and I would say the the, the, the elements which can help us uh, fight all those uh, crises Arthur was uh, telling us about. Um, knowing that worldwide more than 50% of habitable uh, uh, land which we are living and working on is um, yeah, in use for agriculture. In Europe it's about 38, I saw on your sheet. But uh, that gives the, you could say, a, a huge uh, element, uh, uh, pressure on farmers to go into this transition. Um, for us as a farmer, um, we did that through a regenerative agricultural way. And I think we, we proved with uh, our own farm uh, through the Soul Heroes Foundation that it is doable, that you can do it. Uh, the only thing is it takes time, it takes money, it takes knowledge. And in the current system, which um, Art already uh, framed, is that what, um, what the farmers now have is they are pushed in a corner um, with no financial space. So uh, if they are going to chase anything in their own system, it will cost them money. If they don't get any support for that, they won't uh, go in that transition. Knowledge, I think, is also a very big issue. Uh, knowing that all knowledge is still based on a con conventional way of farming. Um, to I can tell you something personal that our, our son went to uh, ag agricultural college in the Netherlands. After two years, he came back and he said to me, Mom, I'm going to quit school. I told him, no, that's not wise. You need to go to school. You need to have your, your uh, graduation. And then he told me, why learn things I won't execute on the farm in the future? He was only learning about fertilization through um, uh, um, chemicals, use plant protection products, how he needs to plow, uh, what tillage he needed to do, more machinery. The old economics was only based on uh, being a bigger farmer in the Netherlands, um, increase, increase, increase. More loans, more financial inputs, more pressure on the farmer um, to, to pay the interest, to pay uh, all the loans back. So that's the current system. On the other hand, if you are asking how is the system 
um, going to stimulate farmers going into that s uh, the, the transition, for instance, to regenerative farming, it's only based on yield, not on quality. What type of food are we producing? And to be honest, if your soils are depleting, your crops are depleting. So it's getting sick more easily. That's what we experience ourselves. The soil is going to be compacted. We experience it ourselves. And we also see that you could say nutrition value, everyone knows it, literature saying it, uh, the depletion of nutrition, not only the, the concentrations, but also the varieties is decreasing. So I see a huge task here for farming to go in that transition, but it is still not in the current system. So um, knowing that it is possible, uh, we went through our s transition on our farm, and we have a farm of more than 300 hectares. So it's not a small farm, especially not for the Netherlands. Um, we, um, we, yeah, we took that challenge, you could say, but only because we wanted to do that change ourselves. But that me meant also that we needed to cut ourselves loose from the current advisors. So we needed to find our own knowledge. We needed to develop our and implement the own techniques of regenerative agriculture, which is nature-based, into our own far farm. So it took us a lot of trial and error experience. Um, uh, we were happy, uh, lucky, I must say, that through the Sol Heroes Foundation, we got funding to make those errors, so to find the right way how we could implement and, and, and go into that transition the right way. And nowadays, we are yeah, receiving more than 500 f uh, visitors per year on the farm, which are asking us, we are not telling them, they are asking us how to do it. And I totally agree with you, uh, Arthur. It's not working for a farmer to say to him how he needs to farm, because every farm is different. Every, uh, not only in size, but also what kind of machinery does he have? Does he have contracts? Does he have a free trade? Uh, what crops does he grow? So every farmer has his own management. And already it is framed as the most economic, feasible way for his farm. Any change in that will cost him money. So he needs to start himself asking questions. Is this for the long term feasible for me or not? Do I have a successor or not? Because that's also a part. I know that more than 50% of the farmers in the Netherlands not knowing for sure if they have a successor. So, uh, and also with the current policy, of course, uh, it, uh, you all know about the nitrogen discussion, which is now um, involved in the, in, in, the, in the dairy sector in the Netherlands. For us, being in the arable sector, uh, that's not an issue, but there are lying a lot of uh, pressures uh, in that. And I think it also starts with that the farmer needs to feel the urge that he needs to go into that transition. And when he is ready to go for that step, then we need to facilitate him with knowledge, with tools, how we can do it. And the best thing is, and that's what we experience, to hear it and learn it from other farmer. So, um, yeah, I, I, see the, I see the huge pressure. I also see... Uh, I would say uh, some sun at the horizon, that there are possibilities. Uh, we shown it uh, on our farm, but the challenges are huge in that. Yeah, thanks, Melanie. It's, uh, it's great to hear about your experience and actually understand what it like. can, can be done, but yeah. obviously a huge challenge. Um, I mean, you mentioned holistic, um, you know, holistic change. Uh, I mean, from what all of you have said, we're talking about an enormous, full-scale holistic change, if you like. Um, Arthur, I wonder if you could sort of start us off by just giving a sense of where the Farm to Fork agenda so far is not sort of, has fallen down perhaps, and where the next commission, if you want to make such a, such a wide change, how it can be rethought or where you would start at least. Uh, I think some of us have been pointing to <coughs> where the Farm to Fork is kind of um, not really picking up. Um, and it's a lot on 
kind of the proposals that have been made that set targets, mm -hmm. um, but in such a broad manner that it's very hard for farmers to see, hang on, am I affected by this, or for who are these targets, or is this across the board, and does that work on my farm, yes or no? And that is where the questions uh, are really starting, and not seeing what is the type of support I'm going to get to get me through this transition. So it's kind of a little bit heartbreak. It is the targets are there, as Alan was saying, and it is important to have the targets, but the means on how to get there are not there. It's kind of hidden in the common agriculture policy, uh, but only if member states really pick up on that and choose this as the way forward. If they don't do that, then the money is going to be used in the usual way, and a lot of that, I, we, as we know, is still going to direct support. So it doesn't have even the sense of, I need to be part of a transition. So what was just described as there was a foundation that helped me in order to also make mistakes, we don't have that, I think, really in the common agriculture policy. And when it comes to maybe I need new machinery or a new way of producing livestock, and that requires investment, that investment help is not readily there. Um, I think I can say, for instance, in Germany, where they try to say, okay, we want to differentiate um, some meat production in terms of animal welfare, but in terms of what was missing is, uh, how do we finance uh, this transition in order to be able to produce that type of meat um, that is being wanted. So th that is where things are not really hanging together. And I totally agree with what was said, that if you can't make it a business model, then kind of farmers are not going to go for it. Um, and that is where pricing is so important. And I don't think that there is a silver bullet that just set one price and then you get the whole thing right. No, I think it's a little more complex um, to do that, um, and it requires that kind of interaction of support, uh, it requires investment help, it requires the price signals, and then the consumption on the other side is of course one of the big drivers, and that we need to get put onto the right track. It's also something um, which you are not going to turn around within a decade. This will take many, many years even if there is many young people who today are changing and shifting their diets, it's still kind of a niche issue um, if you look at the larger agriculture market. Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting, this issue of carbon pricing, or cr pricing for water, actually. I'm glad you brought that up as well, because I feel like water is a very little discussed topic, and I was glad that uh, President von der Leyen put it in her letter of intent for the rest of the mandate. But um, Alan, I wanted to ask you from a sort of economics point of view, how you see um, carbon pricing, because it's obviously a live discussion at the moment for agriculture, um, interacting with the cap, how that could work and how it could drive investment in the right direction. Well, I would certainly uh, support Arthur's call that we should uh, introduce some kind of market-based system. I mean, there is a, an issue of competencies here. It's not easy for the European Union to introduce um, a, a sort of levy-type system. Um, uh, this is, uh, you, you, you need sort of unanimity if you're trying to introduce a sort of a, a, a tax. We're obviously starting with, um, uh, with um, uh, the carbon farming proposal, which is paying farmers for, uh, uh, the idea is to pay farmers for, se for sequestration. Um, to me, that's uh, probably the most difficult end of the stick, rather than uh, simply trying to uh, uh, um, put a price on, on, on emissions. And uh, of course, the idea of carbon pricing is not to penalize farmers, it's to send a price signal that basically uh, emissions are a bad thing and we want you to use uh, methods to reduce them, uh, but obviously any levy income should be returned to the sector uh, and there's different ways in which you could do that uh, to, to ensure that you, you, you get support. Um, so yes, I think uh, we, do we, we, we do need, we're waiting obviously for this um, consultancy report by the end of the year, which is going to advise on you know, whether uh, carbon uh, pr pr pricing in agriculture is, is feasible and how it might be introduced. So 
yes, I, I, I think it is um, uh, an important step to take. Uh, and, and as I say, it's, it's, it's partly a question of competencies between the, the European Union level and, and the national level. Yeah. yeah, I think that issue of competency is so interesting, especially as we get to the sort of implementation phase of the yeah. Green Deal. We have these targets, but now we need to see the member states obviously mm. uh, putting those into practice. Faustina, I mean, how do you see that playing out, particularly in this sector, in terms of the, the, green, yeah, the green Deal targets and sort of getting member states? Do you think member states will be able to meet them? Do you <coughs> see the appetite? But I mean, I'd like to come back on what Archer said about, uh, about the cap and that it could have been or it could be a tool for the transition. At the end of the day, it's a political choice that you make, but there was no such political choice that was made during the last reform. There was a strong opposition from the member states to actually align the policy to the Green Deal targets. And now what's deeply worrying is the latest, uh, uh, you know, how, how would you say, the latest involvement uh, on, the, on the Green Deal and the Farm to Fork agenda. The more we feel the crisis, uh, the more we see climate change, its consequences on farms, droughts, fires, floods, and you name it, yields losses after yields losses, and farmers in total despair, the more pressure to slow down on what some call environmental constraints, therefore regulation, new regulation, we feel. Well, the war in Ukraine has somehow boosted the Green Deal agenda, We've seen that on the energy side, on climate, with the Repower EU, sometimes to the detriment of nature, of the nature agenda, which was something, a big concern uh, to us on the biodiversity uh, priorities. But it was actually instrumentalized against, uh, you know, the food and ag priorities. It was instrumentalized to slow down on the development on these issues, lowering the ambition on the sustainable use of pesticides, uh, regulation, nature restoration law, you mentioned it, soil health law, which was supposed to be a soil health law, which, which is now a soil health monitoring, you know, directive, and led to even no move for now, as you see, on the sustainable food system law. We don't know whether or not it will be eventually published, and if it is, it will be too late anyway to find any sort of agreement before the elections. And they know that very well, and so, you know, what will happen afterwards, that's a big question mark. The same on the integrated nutrient management uh, action plan, which is also a great answer to, you know, crises such as the Russian war in Ukraine, because it can increase, you know, uh, independency, you know, and, and, and sufficiency uh, when it comes to, uh, to fertilizers. And the same on animal welfare, big question mark whether there will be a revision or not. So... Um, even uh, the president of the commission herself, in her State of the Union, uh, she referred to the obligations that have impacts on farmers' work and income, which we need to be mindful of, and did not refer at all to the benefits and importance of a sustainable food system law framework of nature restoration law. She did not refer to the huge gap between the cost of inaction in comparison to the cost of action, which I think is a very, very strong argument. And what's deeply worrying uh, and what we can wit witness now, you know, besides the war in Ukraine, is that as electoral considerations are now kicking in, because the parliament election, as you know, are approaching very fast in June next year, we see that the debate on food, agriculture and nature is getting totally polluted. We witness that the scientific consensus, and that's deeply worrying, is being wiped off, wiped off. We even hear that it's all about opinion, you know, that scientists, well, that's their opinion. No, sorry, it's science. But that's what we hear in the debate now. And, and I must say here that we're very worried to see that a political group, that the, Euro, the EPP, which is, let's remind ourselves, the largest, the oldest center-right group in the European Parliament, whose roots reach back to Europe's founding father, has now started a campaign anti-Green Deal, against the, the, the Green Deal, surfing on disinform disinformation to match the farm rights narratives. So that polarization that they are also creating in a way with this disinformi disinformation, sorry, it's a hard one for French, uh, is extremely unhealthy for, for all. It is not helping the debate because what we need is, you know, to talk, to debate, uh, uh, and, and that polarization across society and in agriculture in particular is uh, uh, very difficult. And here I'd like to quote uh, um, a farmer that uh, I met in France uh, in March who is practicing agroecology and uh, he's enrolled in actually a very good network of uh, the CIVAN, it's called, uh, of farmers uh, sharing uh, agroecological practices. And uh, 
he said at some point, and I found that so telling, that he was furious to hear the word, I mean, the expression, environmental constraints. That would make him so mad. It's so wrong because, indeed, nature is the agriculture's greatest ally. And, um, and even, you know, on his farm, this is what he has done. And economically, it eventually made sense. He changed, you know, like practices on a farm that was very uh, um, conventional and turned it to agroecology. It was not easy, as, as you said, because he had, in a way, they have to set them aside from a system that is still pushing for conventional practices uh, that are not, uh, 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 you know, agroecological and, uh, and necessarily sustainable. Uh, but he did it, and, and these sort of networks are, are, are very helpful, you know, and, and it's exchanges between farmers, as you say, it's not top-down, and it's really exchanges of practice, and they listen to each other, and they trust each other. So yes, we have to pass beyond this, this, this polarization, but uh, where we are now is, is extremely, uh, is extremely um, worrying. So, yeah, I mean, I can only repeat that also for us and, and uh, from the NGOs community, this year are crucial uh, to entry the, gre the Green Deal objectives into law. Uh, we should really not wait uh, any further. The Commission has to put forward its sustainable uh, food system law on the table. Uh, we need to have a deal on the nature restoration law. And also because these binding objectives and these binding targets will be essential for the future reform of the CAP. And hopefully, and then I, I hope that we will have a little bit of time to talk about the CAP afterwards, but uh, still in this panel. But then the CAP can eventually, and hopefully, it will have to become that tool of transition. Yeah, yeah, no, I definitely want to get onto CAP. You're exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to make sure we covered the Green Deal first, because I know the CAP is quite a meaty discussion. Um, I just briefly want to touch on something, though, Melanie, you brought up last night, which I thought was very interesting, where you said that um, visits to your farm had increased a huge amount, I think you said, because farmers themselves are interested in what you're doing because they see the issues all around them with the weather, with, you know, drought, etc. I mean, do you see that farmers are almost, they're doing it themselves without the policy network, but they're obviously coming up against these walls of, for investment and financing? Yes, uh, th that's what I meant with a holistic system. So the banking system is only encouraging the conventional way. So we need also a transition in all the banking system. So instead of a system which uh, relies on investment, uh, return uh, on loans, interest, we need to define, you could say, the, the ends of uh, or, or the ecosystem services which are provided and which are decreasing or ending if we're talking about nature uh, um, sources. So, um, Ellen uh, just touched upon the, the discussion about the carbon sequestration and, and from my opinion, that's much too narrow. We need uh, uh, for carbon sequestration that, that does not give a direct benefit for the farmer also. Eh? We were talking about the quick win. So if we also could give him a payment for biodiversity, for instance, um, then he can and, and, and increase the amount of biodiversity on his farm, then the natural pest control will increase. So that means uh, less diseases in his crop. So he can decrease his amount of plant protection products. If he is going, if he getting a, a reward for the water retention, which he is restoring, um, he will lower his risk in, uh, with this huge climate change, which we are facing now. Even in the Netherlands, where you think we always have enough water, the whole system has been designed to get rid of water as quickly as possible. The last two summers showed us that we had drought and we couldn't cope with it. The whole system in the Netherlands was not sufficient enough to, to, yeah, to, to, to adapt to that uh, big, long drought situation. With our regenerative plots, irrigation was like maybe two times in the whole crop season, conventional plots were like six, seven times. So that's also, uh, you could say, lowering risk. Then you are touching on, not only on points which are speaking for a farmer because he sees that his, uh, his risk on his farm management is going down, but if you can also push him and give him incentives in, in pricing for restoring those services, I think then you have the quick wins. Uh, with, with, yeah, to, to be honest, carbon sequestration is like 
a, a, a word which does not make sense for a farmer because he does not see grow it, uh, he does not see his, his crops being more lively or vital. But if you're talking about water retention, so uh, better, um, uh, better filtration in, in very wet periods, so you have no water on the fields, you have no uh, uh, rotting of your potatoes when you have a, a huge, very powerful uh, rain uh, there, and you have uh, still enough availability of moist in very long, dry summers, then you are talking to a farmer. I think those are elements we really, and, and it's also what Arthur was saying, we really need to talk to a farmer and ask, what are your problems? Where can you help? And it's not only the pricing. It's not only changing the banking system. It's not only pushing farmers into contracts to deliver uh, for a low price so he's going to produce as much as food as possible because otherwise he can't pay his loans back and the interest and, and all the investments he made. No, we really need to, to look at it at, at a holistic way. Mm -hmm. So that is what I, I want to say. It's not just one button we need to push on. Mm -hmm. And also farmers need to change, of course, but uh, it's, a, it's a collaboration. It's really a partnership. And, and, and to come back on that, uh, uh, yeah, partnerships uh, usually yeah, in, 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 the year, in the current CAP system must be with a knowledge institute. But there I say also uh, that I see that um, from my experience for regenerative agriculture going that way, that there was no institute could help us on that because they were behind in knowledge on that. So maybe also to be aware of that, if we are going to evolve uh, subsidies in the future for the CAP, not only make it strict um, a, a requirement that it needs to be with such an institute. It can be uh, an added value, but it's, it's like that if the farmer speaks from experience or from his own um, results, the world does not listen to the farmer, but when an uh, institute is, is telling us about the same data output, then the world is believing him. So um, that's really frustrating for a farmer. They don't feel hurt. They don't feel equal in this playing ground. Yeah, well, hopefully these dialogues, strategic dialogues, will uh, yield some results on that front. Um, I think it's very interesting. I mean, and talking of buttons to push, uh, we've sort of, I want to get onto the cap now. Mm -hmm. um, Arthur, um, or Alan, actually, whichever, I think talking about the eco schemes, we're beginning to see the first results of these coming through from the current cap. Um, I think, Alan, you were saying last night um, in Ireland, some of the money is going to things that farmers already were doing anyway. Um, is that, a, you know, how should we rethink those in the next cap? Are they proving to be beneficial at all? Yeah, I mean, I think my point would be that the most recent cap reform actually has quite a lot of potential. Um, uh, I think it sets uh, quite, a, uh, quite a productive framework for member states to operate within. I mean, just to, 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 to make the point that actually if a member state wanted to shift all direct payments into eco-schemes. It can do that. There's no constraint. Um, so I think the framework is in place, but it's simply not being implemented. And there are, there are incentive, the incentives are not there for farmers, uh, as um, Melanie has been uh, pointing out. So we need to, to shift uh, the, the way in which we um, use our supports to actually support behavioral change rather than simply um, you know, the, the giving the payments on a sort of per hectare basis. But how do you incentivize member states to actually raise their level of ambition? Um, I, I mean, there are some elements in the new um, uh, CAP strategic planning framework uh, which are helpful. Um, uh, for example, there's a list of uh, um, uh, the regulations that we've been talking about that uh, member states should take account of when they are um, uh, designing their interventions and, 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 and setting their, their uh, uh, result indicators and so on. But still the incentives for ministries of agriculture is always to get the money to their clients, to their farmers, as easily as possible with the least hassle and, and therefore the least level of ambition to ask 
the least of their farmers. So how do you actually change that? And uh, to me, um, we need to look at how the budgetary funds are actually allocated to member states. Because uh, w w we can say that at farm level, we want to actually support those farmers who are doing more. Okay, uh, But at the member state level, all of the funds at the moment are pre-allocated. Um, um, and we can discuss the criteria and so on. Um, uh, they don't necessarily make a huge amount of sense, but they're pre-allocated, which means that if, farm, if member states want to be more ambitious, they don't get rewarded for that. Um, so is there a way of trying to look at how we allocate uh, the cap budget between member states? Uh, for example, I would it be possible to uh, to, to top slice uh, in, in, in the next um, uh, multi-annual financial programming period, uh, to top slice uh, an element uh, and to make it, in a sense, competitive uh, uh, funding. So basically, uh, as we do for other EU um, uh, funding lines, uh, LIFE project or some of the, um, uh, the um, uh, InvestEU uh, projects, um, member states make submissions and then there's a panel which actually decides well we think this is what the European Union uh, taxpayer w should, should, should be funding um, um, and in that way try to encourage member states to be more ambitious because they can be within the current framework but they simply are not making use of that at the present time. Mm -hmm. Arthur, I mean you've worked on these topics in the Commission, how would you incentivize member states to better use the cap payments? I think that in the end, <coughs> one will have to hold member states um, accountable for the results of the cap. Kind of if now in the cap strategies you have these high level objectives, if you don't reach them and you have spent all the money, then there is something wrong. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be some recursor then and say, hang on, if we have given you all the money and you haven't delivered on the results, then Kind of why did we give you the money in the first place? Um, and I think that is a discussion we need to have. Um, still, I would think that um, kind of we also need to see can we complement the cup with other elements? So that would bring me back to the pricing because you might be able, at least on the greenhouse gas side, <coughs> to resolve this by looking at carbon pricing it's going to be more difficult on the biodiversity side where you will have to come with incentives. But if you were able to solve the greenhouse gas side with something that is not directly paid by the cap, you would have more resources for saving biodiversity under the cap um, and to make payments that really incentivize the change. Because I think at the moment also many farmers feel that it's just too small. Um, the money that is there. It's not really giving the incentive to change my behavior. Um, so I think also there, in terms of the scale of the incentive, that is something one will have to look at. Um, if I were to look at again at the climate side, it, in fact, it's three big things that you need to look at in agriculture. One is methane, that is related to livestock production. The second is nitrous oxide, which is related to um, areas that are over fertilized and the third one is carbon dioxide emissions that come from many soils in the Netherlands it's the um, organic soils I think these are three big hotspots um, that you need to tackle in one way or the other and I think when it comes to the uh, uh, climate side a lot could be done with pricing and it doesn't have to be a levy that needs to be decided by unanimity I think there is various ways of trying to use emissions trading. It will look different from the emissions trading we have at the present point in time in energy or the one which we have in transport. Uh, we need to tailor it to the conditions uh, in agriculture. So it's going to be a little more complex. Um, but without um, kind of putting a price on those things that cause emissions, uh, how is the com consumer going to decide, oh my dear, this is the wrong thing I'm buying? Um, at the moment, it's not reflected in the price. So the consumer will just continue um, buying as much red meat as he likes to have, but he doesn't pay for 
what the cost is to the environment and to the whole society and to even the farming community at the end of the day. So I think that is, these are things that we need to get right. Yeah, no, the whole issue, as, as you said at the beginning, uh, Faustine as well, consumption, um, it's a full scale problem, which I'm afraid, I don't think in our few minutes left we're gonna have time to address, but I did want you to ask Faustine for your thoughts on the cap and how, because I was interested obviously in the IEEP report, how they sort of frame, you know, a separate fund perhaps um, that could focus more on environmental outcomes. How do you envisage a future cap looking? Yeah, a few points here. Uh, first, on what you said about taking member states uh, accountable for not uh, achieving the overarching objectives. The problem is that the targets are not legally binding yet. I mean, that's a big issue. It's a, a vicious circle. And that's why, I mean, the cap is a fundamental instrument, uh, but there are other prerequisites that you need for the change that, you know, uh, the scale of change that we need. So we need that enabling legal framework, which is the sustainable food system law, to be in place uh, before the next reform uh, of the cap. We also need to tackle, as you said, farmers' income so that they get a decent income for, for, for what they produce. The prices, we need to include also environmental externalities in the price uh, on the shelves and uh, make sure that the sustainable choice becomes the, the choice by default, which is not the case now for consumers. Another point that, uh, well, actually still on member states, sorry, because uh, Matthew, Alan, you said that um, we also need to change uh, mindsets in a way of member states, because still in the current cap, and it's true, they have some sort of flexibility. And by the way, we have five years still to come. We cannot afford five years of stagnation, so it's important that member states improve what can be improved in the five years to come. But on the change of mindsets, what we think is that what needs to change is the current governance of the cap, actually, which is characterized for now by the domination of large agricultural interest and weak involvement of environmental, social, and public health authorities in the decision making. This is not fit for purpose. And actually, as you say, it starts not, I mean, it's not just at decision makers level, it's all the way, you know, from the agricultural schools all the way up to the decision makers. And that's a prerequisite if we want to change the mindset in the national governments, otherwise there won't be change. Another thing which is important, and then I'll dive into the cap, sorry, but it's enforcement and implementation of existing legislation. We tend to forget. But for now, we still see that member states are not properly implementing, you know, the nitrates uh, directive, uh, the sustainable use of pesticides directive, water directive, water from directive, etc. And what we see in our analysis is that the current commission's uh, approach to ensuring compliance, implementation and enforcement of environmental law is also not fit for purpose. There is a lack of political will, will sorry, and oversight for a real enforcement agenda, and that needs to... Uh, to be there because that's also another uh, fundamental uh, uh, building block, let's say. Now moving to the to the cap itself um, and the future cap, uh, the cap post 2027, supporting just transition towards genuine social, economic, and envi environmental sustainability in the farming sector should be the raison d'être of the EU agricultural policy. As I said, this transition mechanism. But that means a clear shift to repurpose the budget, the instruments and administrative systems of the cap towards this new overarching objective and vision in that, uh, in that policy. On the one hand, we need to end immediately measures which cause direct environmental harm, such as support uh, for unsustainable irrigation, intensive livestock rehearing, or farming on drained peatlands. And on the other hand, and that's a fundamental piece of also the position that we will publish on the future cap next, next week, actually, with BirdLife and, uh, and WWF, uh, area-based income support payments and subsidies linked to production should be phased out gradually. We, we are fully aware that this will hit some farms harder than others, and that's why it's important to have also embedded into that future cap a design and design a just transition mechanism to support us in the transition. So that's you know also by gradually phasing out uh, uh, the subsidy, then you're generating you know that money that you can repurpose towards this just transition uh, uh, mechanism. And a last point that I'd like to make, uh, which is linked also to governance actually, uh, but which is very close to my heart because I did some uh, uh, research work when I was at the IEP uh, on that is that we also need to ensure uh, that agriculture is uh, gender balanced. Uh, the panel is quite balanced <laughs> today, so that's, that's very good. That has not always been the case in many panels that have been participated whoops, in the past. Um, but it's 
I mean, also linked to uh, 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 conventional farming and intensive farming, it's interesting that, you know, research shows that uh, conventional farming is actually patriarchal very much, you know. It's designed by men and, and for men. I mean, I'm sure that you can uh, say a few words about that. And often women, because of that, and also uh, we see that on, on, on climate and, and, and other uh, issues, are a driver of sustainability and enabler of change and sustainability. Yet, if we look at who decides on the agricultural policy, actually, it's still very much unbalanced, be it in the Committee for Agriculture or in the Council of Ministers, or even at the top level of the, uh, of the Commission, if you look at the commissioners uh, who were responsible for, uh, for agriculture over the past couple of years. So that's also uh, an important game changer. Thanks, Faustine. Um, sadly, I mean, I, I think we could probably carry on talking all day, but, <laughs> um, but I think everyone probably like cups of coffee and there's a lot more eminent speakers to hear for the rest of the day. So thank you all so much for giving us sort of starting points for discussion. Um, I'm glad we touched on a lot of topics there um, and enjoy the rest of the day, everyone. Thank you. have a coffee break which will last until quarter past 11 so we would ask you to uh, enjoy that and be back in your seats for the second part <laughs>